Today we're fortunate to have another one of our long distance uh, speakers here for the speaker series. Uh, and that's uh, Lisa Fleischer, who has come all the way from Kalispell to speak to us tonight. Unfortunately, uh, it's a really good weather day for driving, so I'm uh, happy about that. Um, Lisa is an MD. She does uh, family medicine at the Kalispell Regional Medical Center. She's been there. In family practice in Northwest Montana since 1988. She started in Rodan, uh, then moved to Kalispell, and worked in private practice for the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes. She's worked in the Lake County Health Department at Kalispell Regional Medical Center. Um, and she's worked part time as medical director of Lake County Family Planning Clinic. Uh, she's uh, been a volunteer physician at St. Jude Hospital in Santa Lucia since 2001, um, and she is the founder and president of Kiwanora he Health Volunteers, um, and uh, I think she's going to be telling us more about that uh, experience tonight, but she spent a lot of time in St. Lucia, so we're anxious to hear about that. Thank you very much. Okay, good, good afternoon, evening. Thank you all for uh, giving me the opportunity to think a little bit about my work in St. Lucia and um, come up with something to say about it. The, the, I wasn't really given a very specific topic, so um, this talk tonight is quite personal um, and fairly general, but hopefully you're going to take some specific things away from it. Um, and I hope through the pictures and through the stories I tell you to give you a little feel of what it's like um, to live somewhere else and to work somewhere else. So how did I, how did I end up in St. Lucia? Well, when I was young, I probably remember in fourth grade thinking, I want to go work out in the world. I, I've got broad horizons. I want to check out some other places. And as I went along in my medical career, I had role models and mentors. So in the bottom right-hand corner is uh, Dr. Janelle Getchis, who, when I started in medical school at George Washington University, was running and living in a variety of uh, clinics and communities in the ghetto in Washington, D.C. And I was able to volunteer with her and her colleagues for several years. And, and then, I don't know, maybe about seven years ago, I was thrilled to be at a national meeting of the American Academy of Family Medicine where she was named Family Physician of the Year. So that was really exciting to see because she was certainly one of my role models. Uh, Dr. Carol, Carol Bearhorst, um, up in the right-hand corner, was a family physician from Kansas who moved to Chimaltenango, Guatemala, where he started volunteering as a family doctor and ultimately set up a, a clinic and a development program that is operative to this day. Um, and then on the left is a more recent colleague and mentor of mine, Dr. Gary Morsh, who with some other family physicians developed a family medicine training program in a variety of nations from the former Soviet Union. That was through a US State Department grant. And I got to go on a few of the trips to some of those sites um, over the last several years in Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Moldova. He founded a nonprofit organization called Heart to Heart International that does work all over the world. Uh, including most recently in Haiti. So how did I end up going to St. Lucia? Well, I got out of medical school, moved to Ronan, started raising a family, worked um, for the, in private practice and then for the tribal um, government for a number of years and then ended up moving up to Kalispell Regional Hospital and the next thing I knew I had children who were growing up rapidly and I thought I need to get back overseas. So. I planned a couple years, took me a couple years to plan it, but I took a three-year sabbatical, um, took my family, my children were seven and 11. We went with my husband to St. Jude's Hospital in St. Lucia. We lived at the hospital, um, and it turned out there were 
a family of other volunteers, people from all over the country, all stages of development, medical students, residents, attending doctors, retired doctors, nurses, physical therapists, and a variety of other volunteers who'd been coming to this hospital year after year. And so we decided we would go back year after year too. So every year since 2001, I've gone to St. Lucia for at least a month um, after my kids got out of the home and grew up and went off on their own. We started going for longer and then it, um, I changed jobs a few years ago so that I could have longer, uh, more time to spend in St. Lucia. So now I spend four months a year in St. Lucia and eight months a year in Northwest Montana doing fill-in work as a doctor. So um, as Peter mentioned, in 2006, a group of volunteers founded, um, with myself sort of as the leader, founded a nonprofit organization called Hiwanara Health Volunteers to help support the hospital. Um, at that time, the hospital was transitioning from being a charity hospital run by a US NGO to being a part of the St. Lucian Health System with an unusual quasi-independent status and the, the volunteer program and some of the affiliations they had in the U.S. had gone away, so we were trying to maintain some affiliations. In 2012, um, we, I was doing some recruitment um, for St. Jude's um, at the American Academy of Family Physicians annual meeting and I asked my daughter who was down in St. Lucia volunteering to create a video about the hospital. And so that's what I want to show you. It's going to give you some basic background. The narrator is a Lucian. Um, sometimes the accent may be a little hard for you to hear. Um, you'll have opportunities for questions. But if, if you listen, open your ears and listen carefully, you, you should be able to understand most of what he says. He's pretty articulate. You are no help. Volunteers, abbreviated as HHV, is a non profitable organization founded in 2006. The purpose of HHV is to support the delivery of health care at St. Jude Hospital in Viewfort, St. Lucia, by supporting the volunteer program, fundraising, and collecting donations and allocating funds for designated projects. St. Jude Hospital is located on the beautiful Caribbean island of St. Lucia. This small island is the home to approximately 160,000 people and is about 27 miles long and 14 miles wide. The interior of the island is primarily composed of a lush tropical rainforest lined by sandy beaches and coastal towns. It is the only island in the world that boasts of its twin pitons, Gro and Piti Piton. St. Jude Hospital is one of the two main hospitals in the country and provides care to almost 66,000 patients. Built by the U.S. government for use during World War II, the hospital was left to sit abandoned for a decade and a half until 1966 when it was founded as a charitable hospital by a group of nuns, the sisters of the sorrowful mothers whose headquarters was in Milwaukee. In 1992, the St. Jude Hospital was handed over to the government of St. Lucia and in 2003, with the passage of St. Jude's statutory status, the hospital became part of the national health system. It is now governed by an appointed board of directors made up of community members appointed by the Ministry of Health. In September of 2009, a fire devastated the hospital and evacuation of the facility was required. Operations were moved to the nearby George Odlum Stadium, and the hospital has been based out of this location for the past three years. Five now. The government of St. Lucia, in consolidation and assistance from the Taiwanese government, Republic of China, and many other foreign and local donors, 
Reconstruction of the old hospital site is estimated to be completed by April of 2013. 16. In the meantime, <laughs> the Olympic track and field stadium has been transformed into a 68-bed, fully functional medical facility. Outpatient services lead the way as revenue producers with payments generally required at the time of service. There is a walk-in clinic offered Monday through Friday, a continuous 24-hour emergency department, basic lab procedures, x-ray and ultrasound. Specialty clinics occur most days of the week and include internal medicine, diabetic clinic, pediatric, gynecology, obstetric, orthopedic, psychiatry, general surgery, inpatient and outpatient physiotherapy, urology, air, nose and throat, dentistry, cardiology, and a new dialysis center. Inpatient departments include medicine, pediatrics, obstetrics, surgery, and an ICU and CCU unit. Support services include administration, <coughs> business office, information technology, <coughs> purchasing, maintenance, housekeeping, a dietary, biomedical, and health information departments. Medical staffing includes full and part-time attending physicians, nurses, house officers, and volunteers. Financing is a public-private mix. Salaries are paid by the government and other expenses, supplies, utilities, etc. are covered by revenue. There is some employer-based insurance and limited government-funded insurance, but overall, reimbursement is very low. The population on average makes the equivalent of 5,000 US dollars a year. The volunteer program has played an essential role at St. Jude's Hospital since its inception. Many of the services are provided by an international community of volunteers who work alongside permanent staff. Volunteers come from all walks of life and many religious traditions. All share a common desire to use their time and talents in service to others. Volunteers help the staff tremendously in many ways. They lessen the staff's workload as many of the departments are understaffed. Volunteers also make it possible for the staff to take much needed vacations from work. Finally, Volunteers also provide medical services that may otherwise be unavailable. For example, there is not a local ophthalmologist, so this department relies entirely on volunteers. The mission behind the volunteer program is that people who desire to volunteer can work and have fun on the island. There is a volunteer coordinator who takes care of this aspect of the program. The care provided by volunteers not only helps the hospital and staff directly, but also influences the lives of countless St. Lucian people. The volunteers working hand in hand with St. Jude Hospital have a symbiotic relationship, providing services to those in need while opening eyes and hearts to this beautiful country and its people. Okay. Our narrator. He was the short man. Oh, there he just went. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hopefully you could understand that. I always enjoy watching it and to see my 
family. Okay, so this is the this slide is the summary of the crux of my talk. My five lessons that I decided will will summarize what I've learned um, in my years of working in St. Lucia and this picture, I've used this actually in some other talks. Um, it's taken from a suspension bridge in Glacier, and I, I feel like sometimes I'm walking between two different worlds. And I enjoy that, and I like to bring some of our world to St. Lucia and some of St. Lucia to here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my, my personal feelings of what I've learned and a few stories to illustrate them, and then I'm going to go into details with these five kind of subjects and, and hopefully get some input from you as the audience. So. Um, the first one I had to learn um, is patience. I grew up with the New York Minute. I grew up 20 minutes outside of New York City. And um, coming to Montana was a step in the slowing down. Moving to the Mission Valley was a slowing down step. But moving to St. Lucia was a whole other thing. And I've had to really take some deep breaths at times when I've been impatient to see things move at a, a pace that you know, I'm kind of used to. Um, being patient helps you do number two, which is learn. So over the years, I've learned a lot of different lessons um, from being in St. Lucia. Being patient has helped me get there. Um, Fifteen years of working in the outpatient clinic, finally this year they asked me if I would provide medical supervision because they don't really have anybody with as much training as I do. And I was amazed how much I really learned about how the hospital works this year because I got to go to meetings of the heads of departments, meetings of the consultants, of the other co uh, doctors. I got to know people a lot better. But it took me 15 years to get to the point where I got into that little bit more of an inner circle um, where I really learned a lot. In contrast to that, just the little contrast of somebody starting out new, um, there was an internal medicine doctor from Connecticut who was coming to volunteer this year, and she got my phone number through HHV, and she called me multiple times in the weeks before she came, and she was very anxious about her experience. She was very anxious that everything go okay. And so at one point, she wanted me to fax the hospital formulary to her so that she could memorize all the medications and doses on the formulary so that when she was seeing patients, they wouldn't have to wait for her to figure out which medicines to write. Now, most people spend at least three hours at the hospital waiting to be seen in the first place. So her taking 10 minutes to look up the drug, most of the drugs are pretty, much, pretty similar to what we have in the US anyway, you know, really wasn't necessary. So I told her, it's going to be okay. People are used to waiting here. And the formulary was four years outdated anyway. So um, being patient, um, taking, a, taking a deep breath. As I've learned more, it's been easier for me to connect with the staff and to make friends. Um, and that comes in handy a lot of times because I'm out of my element often. So. A little story from this year. This was my most unusual patient that I saw this year when I was in St. Lucia. This young man, he was about 20, came in and he said, Doc, last night when I was falling asleep, well, this morning at like 3 in the morning when I was falling asleep, I saw a rat running around in my house. And then when I woke up this morning, I've got all these rat bites on the end of my toes. And sure enough, he shows me his, takes off his flip-flops, shows me the ends of his toes, it looks like, the, the callus or the skin has been abraded away, and there's a little bit of bleeding. Well, I, I couldn't really believe the story. It seemed unbelievable that somebody could sleep through rats nibbling on their toes, but I try to believe people. I try to listen. I'm trying to learn. So I went to talk to one of my colleagues who's been there for 15 years also. She's from Guyana, and I told her the story. She said, oh, yeah, yeah, that happens all the time. We see that all the time. And she told me what to do, what to recommend to him, and gave me some other information about rat bites and the germs that rats spread. So one of the things I like about being a family doctor is it's something different every day and you're learning your whole life. So as time goes on and you have more contacts, 
you may get information that helps you build capacity in the environment you're in. So I'm going to tell you a little story about what happened with me in that one. So about seven, eight years ago, I was the president of Hewanor Health Volunteers, and I got an email from the CEO of St. Jude Hospital putting me in touch with a couple of people in the Seattle area. And the leader of this group was an OBGYN. She lived in a little com residential community where they had a tennis pro who was from St. Lucia. And he'd been teaching the families in this community how to play tennis for 20 years. And I wanted to do something really special for him. And so he was from St. Lucia. And he said, well, if you really want to do something that would make me happy, do something for St. Jude Hospital in St. Lucia. So, the CEO put them in touch with me. Well, the OBGYN wanted to do something that would help the OB department. It turned out that a group of, a rotary group from Bremerton, Washington had just finished remodeling the OB department at the St. Jude Hospital, but they didn't have any maternity beds. Somehow I found out that the community hospital in Missoula, Montana was getting some new maternity beds and they would be willing to donate their maternity beds to this hospital in St. Lucia. So, Hewanora Health Volunteers paid the shipping. People in, from Community Hospital arranged to get the beds shipped. We covered the cost, and those maternity beds are still being used today in St. Lucia. So that's about making connections with people. My final little comment is living the life. Get out and live the life. So when we first started going to St. Jude's Hospital, we lived at the hospital. We rode the transports. These are little vans with, yeah, I can cram maybe 15, 20 people in them. The music's blaring, they, drop, they pass only on curves and going up hills and kind of death-defying, but we took our children and we rode around on those transports and went out to all kinds of places. They broke down and we sat on the side of the road and chatted with people and got to see how people live locally. When I was in Tajikistan, I'd go want, sit in the park and uh, when I had a little time off, and just invariably somebody would come up to me and start talking to me. I talked to some high school girls and learned about what they were doing in school and what they wanted to do with their lives. I was drawing a picture, and this guy came and looked over my shoulder, and he asked me what I was doing, and he knew a little English. I said, oh, I'm here as a doctor. I'm volunteering. He whips out his cell phone. He says, my cousin's a doctor. He calls in the number, puts the phone up to my ear. So I'm talking to some doctor in Tajikistan, just because I kind of put myself out there. Uh, I contrast that to a little bit, uh, a little bit to some students I have. I regularly have students from Des Moines University Physician Assistant School program um, come and volunteer and spend two weeks uh, working with me in St. Lucia. They get a little guide, guided information before they come down there that tells them where to go to eat and hang out. And it's about five minutes from the hospital. And that's all they do. They miss getting out there, being with people. They ride a taxi back and forth. And I try to encourage them to get out because that's how you learn about another culture is to get out and live in the culture. Okay, so now your turn. I want to start with the concept of being patient. And when I was thinking about how patient I've worked at becoming, I thought about, well, why do, you, why do I need to be patient? And, and it's because there's different time pressure in different worlds. In the world of Montana is not quite like the world in New York or Florida, where I spend time too. But why do you think some places are more time pressured than others? What do you, what do you, anybody got any ideas what that might come from? So expectations of the culture. Heat. Heat, yeah. It's hard to really walk fast when you're hot. And on the other hand, when you're in a cold place, you kind of have to keep moving to stay warm. I have to keep moving to stay warm here. But heat, heat kind of slows things down. What else? Walk to help someone, so you try and do as quickly as possible before that. Mm -hmm. So feeling like, feeling a, a, a push to get things done for other people. Patients. Number of patients that you have to see, yeah. How far they have to travel to go home, so depending on their commute, mm -hmm. you want them to mm -hmm. be able to get back 
Mm -hmm. Though that's a few of the things that people have said, like wanting to take care of the patients quicker, wanting, you know, that's our concern. In, in, honestly, in St. Lucia, some people come and, and plan to spend their whole day at the hospital. It's kind of a socializing thing, and plus, they don't have, yeah, they're kind of dependent on public transportation, so that is one of the things they do tend to need to leave at the end of the day. But some of them will just sit around and socialize when they're done because they've made the whole effort to get there. Any other ideas? Technology. Technology speeds things up in general for us. I mean, I'm not a complete believer in that 100% of the time. But um, for example, when you go to the bank, this is the line at the bank all the time. And everybody just stands there and waits till the, the little recording says, teller number five. Um, people don't bank online, though they're slowly getting there. People go to the power company to pay their power bill and stand in line. They go to the water company to pay their water bill. And towards the end of the month, you know, it, it's kind of another social thing. People are going online, they're going to the bank to get some money. Then everybody walks over to the power company and they wait there for a while. And, then they, and so people are pretty used to waiting there. You can't pay your water bill online. You can't. There is that. Now, we found out this year that you can pay it at the grocery store. Um, if you go to buy, my husband went to buy a microwave this year. It took him 45 minutes to get through the paperwork. He knew which microwave he wanted. There were only two choices, and he knew which one he wanted right when he walked in the door. But some of it is just they're still handwriting out receipts, then they're entering it into the computer. They have to stamp it three times, getting a, a driver's license down there. You had to go back and forth between two buildings four times to get the process done. So some of it is just some systems are built a little less efficiently than others. Um, if you're a subsistence farmer, you're not wearing a watch. You're not necessarily checking the calendar. I mean, when your crops are ready to be harvested, that's when you <laughs> take them to somebody to sell them, or maybe you sell them yourself, and then you get enough money so you can buy some seed or some starts to plant another crop. But your cycling of your life may not be around a clock or a calendar. It may be more around the cycle of, of your whatever the agricultural pursuit you're in. Now, the tourist industry is the number one industry in St. Lucia now, but agriculture is number two and was number one for a long time. And there's still a lot of people who are living a subsistence agricultural life. Then there's very high unemployment. I think maybe up to 60% of the population is unemployed. So they're not punching a clock. They don't have to get up in the morning. They don't have really anywhere to be. And a lot of places around the world are like that. You know, we're a lot more time pressured. OK, learning. Computers are everywhere. This is the, um, the nurse manager of the outpatient department having a, a moment of staring at the computer and trying to get through. So when, have any of you operated in other cultures where languages were different? What kind of problems can you encounter when, when you're operating in a different language? Not understanding. Yeah, completely missing the boat. What yeah. else? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So you, you think you understand, but you don't. And what kind of problems could you have from that? I mean, as you know, there's there's lots in the medical world um, that can cause difficulty. What else? Vocabulary. Mm -hmm. yep. Maybe you don't have the words to describe what's going on, or they don't have the mm -hmm. words in your language to describe what's going on. Mm -hmm. And you miss out on some of the details. Um, you may jump to conclusions that are wrong. The difficulty in sharing complex thoughts. Might be able to get the simple things across, but when you really get into complex ideas and thoughts, it becomes mm -hmm. a whole other challenge. Yeah, the other thing is, as a volunteer going into a different culture, if 
people may look at you and assume that you're not going to get it. And so they may not, they may keep it simplistic for your sake. I had that happen to me a couple of years ago. I was working in a community clinic down there and this guy came in and he just took one look at me and I could see from his body language and his expression, he thought, oh, this lady is not going to get it at all. And he, you, he looked very disgruntled. Now, by the time he was done, he was okay because I had taken the time to figure it out and I wasn't completely clueless about how things go there. So over the years, in St. Lucia, they speak a um, dialect called Patois, which is a blend. It's like Creole. It's a blend between French, English, and then some African kind of dialect stuff. A lot of it, frankly, as I've gotten better at understanding it, is just English spoken with a Caribbean accent. <laughs> it's English words. I'm like, okay, is that what you're saying? Um, and so I actually did start studying Patois because I felt like it would really help me get by. And so what's been interesting about it is, one, is I can understand their English a lot better. So even though I still often need a translator for people who aren't at all English speaking, at least I understand their English better. And then the other is I always try to speak in, in Patois. I always throw in a little something and people find it very amusing. People find it, I think they appreciate the effort to try to understand what they say. And then at times I actually do understand what they say. A lot of the people there who claim they don't speak English, which are the elderly people, they actually understand English about as well as I understand Patois. And sometimes we'll both speak in our own language and usually there'll be a third party there who can correct us if we're wrong. Um, so you do, if you're in a country where you are not speaking the language, you definitely want to get a translator. In the medical world in America, the expectation is that you will get a professional because family members may have biases that we're supposed to try to keep out of the translation process in this country. I don't think you'll generally have that luxury everywhere you go in the world. And, you know, in addition, I feel that family members often have important information to share, um, though sometimes they may interfere with a patient's ability to communicate, too. Okay, making friends. And I don't mean necessarily, you know, best friends forever, but getting out there and mingling with people and getting to know people. So. When one is in an international setting as a volunteer, somebody in my position, I'm a doctor, so, you know, the assumption may be that I'm the expert. But, you know, in this picture, who do you think's the expert and who's expert in what? And what are the pitfalls of going into a different country and, and, and professing to be the expert? Ideas? <laughs> One of the problems is that you've got a completely different range of illnesses, many of which aren't necessarily common or familiar here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In addition, and other, other comments? Different illnesses? Cultural context. Yep, not understanding the cultural context. What else? Well, not just the cultural context, but the logistic, logistical context. Um, I've seen doctors swoop into St. Lucia. There was a guy there one year who wasn't even really invited, but he walked into the ER. He was a cardiac specialist. Somebody was having a cardiac problem, and he starts yelling, call the helicopter. This patient needs to be evacuated. They don't have a helicopter. They can't evacuate the patient. That's not realistic. What are your local resources that you're working with? Um, the doctor on the left is a pediatric ER specialist um, from Chicago, and he started um, he, in St. Lucia, and he was there in March for a week. He was recruited by a pediatric developmental specialist who's been going there for a long time and works with the gal on the right who's a local pediatrician. And he did a lovely job of deferring to the local physicians as his, as his go-to. They wanted him to, to help them make some decisions. So this is the other pediatrician. 
And this baby in the incubator, the first day he got there, after about two hours at the hospital, I toured him around and I dropped him off with her. They had a baby that had just was a couple of days old and was dying. And they really didn't know why, but they knew that was going to happen. And Dr. Neil Burt, on the right, was asking him, well, tell us, you know, what do you think we should do? What do you think we should do? And he was... He's worked overseas in other settings before, and he was really hesitant to j swoop in there and just say, oh, well, I would do blah, 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 blah. So he said, well, tell me what you're doing. And he reinforced everything they were doing. He had one suggestion um, for a drug that they could use um, if it was available. But he was very humble about the situation, um, which, is, which is the appropriate way to be. Oftentimes, if you're not, um, people will, will, will just push you aside and, and dismiss you as irrelevant. And they may be polite about that. That's been my experience. They won't tell a volunteering expert to their face, you don't know what you're talking about. But, and they, they will probably thank you, but they may discount you because you're not really working with them. And I think that's the goal is collegiality. Um, and there's so much to learn, honestly. Um, you know, there, we probably have more to learn in these settings than we have to teach, or, you know, and, and the mutuality of that, trying to find an inter intermediate between one world and another that is going to function in their world, um, I think is important. So I want to talk a little bit about my, my, my colleague, Tessa Robinson. Now, when I started looking into volunteering overseas. And when I started working overseas, there was a lot in the literature about when you go into a setting, you don't want to show favorites. You don't want to give one person something and not give somebody else something because you may interfere with the local kind of homeostasis. There's politics in every work setting everywhere in the world. And you can cause disruption by going in there and you know one person comes up to you and say, oh, doc, doc, I really need a new stethoscope. Could you get me a new stethoscope? I really need a pair of shoes. I really need this. I need that. And one is hesitant and one is advised not to show favoritism. And, and there's a lot of reasons for that. You don't want to be pitting people against each other. And when resources are scarce, you want to be sure that you're allocating resources to the place with the greatest need, which may not be necessarily the person with the loudest mouth. Having said that, over the years, I've worked for 15 years with Dr. Tessa Robinson, and she's become my friend and my colleague. And ironically, of all the doctors I've worked with over my 30 years in practice, She's the one I've felt the most intellectual connection with. So we've gone to conferences together, and um, we communicate by email together. And our, my daughter, who's in medical school, has spent time working with her. Her daughter this year spent time over at my house learning about some trips I went on. So we've become, we've become friends over the years, and I, I feel great about that. This is her family. Um, her older daughter's a genius. She needs to go to a really good university soon. So if anybody's got any ideas about that, speak to me afterwards. <laughs> um, she took me to a medical dental uh, council party in St. Lucia a few years ago where I got to interact with um, doctors from around the island and just have a good time. So that's a little aside just for fun. Building capacity. So as George Lee St. Jour said in, in the video, Part of what Hewanora Health Volunteers has been about is building capacity, not just human capacity by recruiting other volunteers and trying to help the volunteer program, but also um, helping with materials. And I have learned a lot about how things can go wrong in that department over the years. Um, what kind of things do you think can go wrong with foreign aid? And we, we sometimes refer to it as and I don't want to offend anybody, but this is the term I've heard, junk for Jesus. Because sometimes stuff is brought into other countries that doesn't end up being terribly helpful. So um, does anybody have any comments about that? What could go wrong in foreign aid and what's foreign aid about? It's kind of like going into a specific area with the idea of the of Right. Yeah, and so you might bring stuff that's completely irrelevant, and 
you know, garbage is a problem all over the world. What do you do with this stuff? I mean, where does it go? Some medical waste isn't even really very safe. Um, what else? Bringing stuff to the technology level is not, you can't support it. Yeah, well, the, and sustainability is a huge issue. I mean, something as simple as a glucometer for testing blood sugar, the companies will give you those for free. The problem is the strips cost a dollar a strip, you know, and people can't afford the strips. At the end of that video, he talked about the dialysis unit. That's been hugely controversial. The dialysis unit, they was the, the materials were donated. The dia, dialysis machines were donated to St. Jude's, but the cost of dialysis is the dialysate. That's an ongoing cost. Well, they just forced St. Jude's to actually take over the dialysis unit. It's been housed at the hospital for the last several years, but they didn't want it because it's, it's a money loser. People can't afford dialysis, but they're getting it. And so the, the financial sustainability, um, the hospital was in, uh, unable to run electrolyte testing for quite a bit of time because they didn't have the money to buy reagents. Um, so it's a problem. And the other thing is it's a missed opportunity to get them stuff that they truly do need. A lot of times what's brought is what people have. And, you know, I've been guilty. Sometimes two-way communication is missing. And so you'll tell them you have something and they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, bring that down. But they don't even really need it, it turns out. Within this context, you said there were two hospitals on there. Mm -hmm. What's the relationship with the two hospitals? Do they get volunteers? Do they get stuff? No, you know, the other hospital is part of the, has, was built as the government hospital. The, it's on the north end of the island. The island's about the size of Flathead Lake. Most, the majority of the population lives at the north end. That's also where the cruise boats come in and where all the big tourism is, where the resorts are. So that's part of the, it's a national hospital, it's a government hospital. The hospital that I volunteer at is at the southern end of the, of the island, and it was founded by the, the, as a charity hospital because there was no health care down there. And though it's only an hour away, it's kind of an hour that's similar to the going to the sun highway. You can't just whip up there. And if you're having a baby or if you've got an emergency, it's way too far. Now the hospital is, is, is part of the national system, but it's not on exactly the same grounds as the, as the national hospital. So the national hospital is more completely funded by the government. This one isn't. But does it have a dialysis unit and does it have? Yeah, and they probably have the same problems. There's also a private for-profit hospital up north. Um, which, you know, ha nobody can, I mean, only the wealthy can afford to go to, which is a very small percentage of the population. Um, so, yeah, what can go wrong? A variety of things. Um, so the George Odlum Stadium that they moved into five years ago is falling apart. And they're really in a crisis right now because they've got to get out of the stadium. The stadium was built in, I think, 2004 by the Chinese government. And in 2017, they're hosting a regional track and field event uh, uh, competition. So they've got to have this place functional by then. The place is falling apart. It's dangerous. Every plumbing fixture is broken. It was not designed to be a 68-bit hospital. But um, the finances of reconstructing the other site um, have been problematic. Now they're, they're in another, they just got $30 million from Taiwan. They got some money from Mexico. They are planning to move in in January to the remodeled hospital. But you know, when they made that video a few years ago, they were going to be moving in then too. So nobody's holding their breath yet. So I want to tell a little story about the materials management issue. Because this year, I, I had a, a few. Uh, Varied experiences with that. So last year, a colleague of mine from Kalispell Regional, uh, Brent Pistorisi, he's a pulmonologist, came down and spent a month down there working on the medicine department. And he came away feeling that it was really important that St. Jude have some specific um, technology for cardiology and pulmonology. And he was able to collect 
an echocardiogram machine, a spirometer, a bronchoscope. Um, we got two EKG machines and a number of patient monitors, which we shipped down to St. Lucia, and they arrived while I was there. It was all stuff they needed, but there were problems. The spirometer, which is a machine that measures uh, lung flows, has a disposable mouthpiece. We had a few of those, but you have to order the disposable mouthpieces, and they cost about $140 for a box of 100 of them. Now that's fine, I wouldn't mind buying one box, but I would want some sustainability built in. So we could use the spirometer at the outpatient clinic and charge the local people 3EC, which is the Eastern Caribbean currency, to cover the cost of replacing that disposable mouthpiece, except that they don't have a department budget. And so we can't budget to replace those items. If, it gets, if we get mo money for this, for this piece of equipment, it goes into the general fund, and that money will eventually be used for whatever it is they need the most next. So I can't even figure out how to arrange to sustain use of that spirometer without finding some outside source of funding. The echocardiogram machine works, but unfortunately the radiologist who was employed at the hospital left while we were there. So there's not a trained person to do an echocardiogram, except there is a private cardiologist on island, and they're going to work with him. Um, we, we have a uh, cardiologist in Calspell who is willing to come down and do some training next year, and so I think the echocardiogram machine will be used but it's again, it's patience. It's operating at the local time frame, which is that it takes a while to get this implemented. Another story from this year, which was a success in my mind, is this lady with her walker. So last year I started going, working in a little small community health center. And the staff there took me out doing some home visits where we went out to people's homes. And most of the people in the home visits were were homebound because they were unable to ambulate. They were mostly elderly people or otherwise disabled. And after my days of walking around town, seeing these people, I thought, well, they need walkers. Walkers would make a huge difference for these people. So I walked or I went to secondhand stores and managed to get 10 walkers that I just bought myself at secondhand stores because they were cheap. And I shipped them down with the echocardiogram machine and these other things. So this year I was out at the, the clinic, it's in a little fishing village called Labrie, and this lady with the flowered dress came in and I saw her for some problem. She, it took her several minutes to walk into the office and she was walking like this, she had a stick and she was holding onto the wall. She was walking really slowly and she sat down, plopped down in the chair. We talked about her medical problem and she went to get up, and it was all she could do to get up out of her chair. And I said, wait a second, sit down. I want to go talk to the nurse. So I went out to the nurse. I said, hey, will you still have those walkers I brought? She said, yeah, we've still got a walker. I went and got the water, walker and gave it to this patient. She stood up. She took three steps, and the smile on her face was priceless. She put her arms up in the air, and she said, I'm strong. I'm strong now. I can do what I need to do. She went home with that walker, and she was a happy woman. She said, she, she said, you've got to give me a kiss. You've got to give me a kiss. And so I said, okay, you've got to let me take your picture then. And she was just the happiest. And I felt like, okay, I had managed to bring some appropriate technology. That was score one. I've, I've, had, I've had some less successful stories in the past. <laughs> so, okay, good. I'm winding up. And hopefully I'll have some time for questions. So after 10 years of living at the hospital, my husband and I decided we'd buy a little house because we found this cute little house and become locals part time. And my experience having a home there is the same lessons of learning how to, how to adapt to that culture. And I stand out. 1% of the population in St. Lucia is white. So wherever I go, people recognize that I'm not necessarily a local. Though over time, you know, I've, people know, are getting to know me. I'm definitely the only white woman riding a bicycle uh, to the hospital every day, though there was another one riding to the beach this year. Um, 
So now we go, my husband goes and pays, stands in line to pay the bills. We go to five hardware stores every time we want to do a project on the house. Um, we watch local TV. We're trying to learn about the local politicians. We have friends. We have colleagues. Um, one of my major hobbies is, is gardening. And it's another apt example of sort of the principles of this talk. You got to be patient when you garden, though you got to be a lot less patient there than you do in Montana because things grow so fast. So this property we bought was actually a property where the US military people who were building the hospital and also the airport were housed. So the property was, is a steep property with a lot of rubble. So I had a lot to do. So I started out terracing and um, building up the soil, planting things, clearing out the rubble. So I planted, I think the second year we had the house, I planted a tree that was a stick this big with a branch off of it in this hole that I'm digging there. I came back a year later and the tree was already that big. The tree up in the, up in the middle there. And other things were growing all around. Um, one of the ways I've gotten to learn about how to garden in St. Lucia is by talking to farmers who come to see me as patients. And that's really helped me integrate into the culture. People love it when I ask them. You know, they're coming to me, they feel, you know, they're kind of burying themselves and I'm the expert. Well, they're the expert when it comes to gardening. So I'm always picking their brains enthusiastically and they're enthused that I'm even interested. Oops. So now that's the tree. This year, that's looking from below it. That's, it's been pruned three times this year. It had hundreds of blossoms on it. I've eaten apples off of it already. That's in four years. Incredible. So um, I feel like I've been blessed to have this dual life in, in these two worlds. I hope you got a little feeling about what that might be like and something that you can take home to the work that you're doing or other things that you've learned about in this course. Um, I love this quote from Gandhi, so I often like to end with it. And um, I welcome your questions or comments. Thank you. If anybody has any interest, oh, yep, go ahead. Well, I'm just curious. Uh when you want to get some help, let's say, from the locals, do they have a very uh, laid-back attitude about getting the work done? Because uh, so, yeah. I had an experience where uh, you go down to build a hospital, it should take six months to do it in this country, two years down there, because, you know, they show up and maybe get, you know, three or four hours of work out of your workman a day. It's a real issue. My husband does construction. And when we bought this house, it was just one bedroom, basically, and a living room, dining room. And we did hire local help to build onto it. And yeah, there were a few days I thought he was going to have a heart attack. He was so stressed. I mean, I got home one day. He was lying there. And I'm like, what are you doing? Well, he had been at the door place you know, for hours, just you know, banging his head against the wall. It is an issue. And, at the hospital, I would say at times there's a little bit more of a sense of imperative because we are dealing with sick people, but there have been times where the, the, the slow pace and the lackadaisical attitude has been <coughs> quite frustrating there. Um, one thing, in the 15 years I've been going there, what has changed immensely is that there are more local people who have been trained as doctors and are coming out of the country and have come back to practice. And nurses as well, and other ancillary staff like the physical therapists and um, some of the people in administration. And so I think slowly that is starting to move the bar. Um, they, there's a local physician who trained, uh, a number of the Lucian physicians got to go to Cuba for medical school. Cuba's kind of a regional healthcare 
uh, leader. And so there's quite a few, they call them the Cuban doctors. They're not Cuban, they're Lucians, but they train there. And so this guy came back and he, a lot of their, their doctors are, have gone to medical school but haven't had any advanced training and they just stay and they work in various departments. So he'd been working in the ER for a number of years and got an opportunity four years ago to go over to Israel and do a fellowship, uh, do a residency in emergency department. So emergency departments, like that's the kind of department where you want people who are gonna, you know, kind of get excited when somebody's really sick. Coincidentally, I was in Israel in the fall and I called him and we ended up meeting and talking and he realizes how hard it's, he's expected to come back and manage the department. He's got a, He's got, he has to come back. It's part of the deal. They let him go with the understanding that he would come back and work for th at least three years there. He's going to have to run this department. And he said, wow, I get it now. You know, you, you volunteers would come and you'd say, oh, this isn't how things go in America. And he said, now I get it. He said, we have been on vacation in St. Lucia. We haven't been working. And he's going to have to work with his colleagues there who are probably going to resist him. And I think... My experience working for the, um, for the tribes in, in uh, the Flathead was that it, it was almost harder to be a, somebody returning to the reservation as an expert than a foreigner. And I, I think for him, he may get even more resistance than somebody else coming in from the outside will. So it'll be interesting to see how he does, because, yeah, and at home, I can take a deep breath. I'm not so worried about it. My husband's a little more stressed at home. At the hospital, I do have times where I, I sometimes just have to get a little New Yorky and be pushy. And, and when I feel like a patient's life is in danger or they're experiencing more suffering than I'm comfortable with because of people being lackadaisical. <clears throat> Give us some examples of uh, the kind of yeah, you know, what I've done down there primarily is um, they have um, medical education talks for the staff on a regular basis, so I've done a variety of talks, some requested by them and some ones that I've done up here that I thought would be useful for them. Um, and then I serve as a resource for the staff in the family. I work mostly in the outpatient clinic. And so we see walk-ins. And when I'm there, I'm a resource for the other doctors who work there. I mean, who have experience on the ground, but um, some more than others. Because these doctors who are in training cycle through. So, um, as far as there's not a family doctor on staff, so I don't have peers there that I work with so much. Um, directly, but certainly specialists, because family medicine is really more of an outpatient setting thing. Uh, I, my training has been more, I guess, general, very various subjects, but specialists who come in who have skill sets that the local doctors are trying to learn, like this ER doctor, this, the way he ended up going to Israel was there was a, a group that came in from Israel and did uh, advanced life support training for the hospital. So they have those kinds of experiences. Um, surgeons who have particular techniques that they're willing to teach the local surgeons. Um, the focus at St. Jude has not been on training. It's been more on provision of care. That was how the facility started because when, when the nuns started it, there were really very few doctors at the southern end of the island. And so the doctors who were going in there were the only doctors at times there. I mean, there have been times I've been in St. Lucia where there were two doctors staffing the ER 24-7. One would work days, one would work nights. If somebody wanted a day off, the other person worked 24 hours. So filling in, you know, now things are shifting as they have more locally trained doctors. And so the goal over time is for this facility is they want to become more of a teaching hospital and they do want volunteers to start doing more of that kind of training. So that is, I think, the future there. Well, uh, thank you again, Lisa. I really especially appreciate the um, personal touch that you brought to your talk. That's probably all I had. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, here's a person who not only goes down there to work in St. Jude's Hospital, 
but unlike any of the other speakers, I think, in this lecture series, actually decided to live there and build her own house and become a resident. Uh, that's, a, that's a really uh, further step than, uh, than most of us take, so I think she really needs to be appreciated for that as well. Um, I'm sure Lisa will meet individually with any of you if you'd like to after we, um, after we depart. Uh, but I wanted to tell you a little bit more about the last lecture in the lecture series, uh, which is next week, and it's going to be offered by uh, Richard Barrett on uh, the work of Missoula Medical Aid in Honduras. Uh, Professor Barrett is uh, also a member of the uh, Montana Senate, and so he, when he said that he would be willing to participate in the lecture series, said, but I have to make sure it's after the legislature is over. And so, as you probably know, the legislature did conclude here on Monday, so he's now available to speak to us next week, so I recommend that to you. And then also let me remind you about two other things. One is, um, some of you still have one or two papers to turn into me. I think we're getting pretty close to having papers from everybody, uh, but please don't forget to get those into me. Um, and secondly, don't forget about the uh, celebration event that we're going to have two weeks from now at 7 o'clock. Uh, that's going to be in the President's this room at Brantley Hall. President's Hall at Brantley Hall, which is very close to here, um, starting at 7 o'clock. Um, and we'll have refreshments there as well. And we're going to have a chance to get everybody together. Many of the speakers as possible, the faculty, the students, uh, and members of the external advisory committee to the Global Public Health Program who really sponsored this lecture series. So uh, I think you'll really enjoy that as an opportunity to uh, interact with us, uh, with one another and with these speakers. So let's thank Lisa again. And, uh,